This is KGW News at 5. But what we know is that it's certainly possible that by Christmas, we will be reporting more than double the case rates we are seeing now. And when I think about that, I am just horrified. A grim outlook today from Governor Kate Brown as the state breaks this single day record for both new COVID cases and deaths. Thanks for joining us for KW News at 5. I'm Kristen Severance in for Laurel today. Governor Brown urged Oregonians to stay vigilant through the holiday season as we wait for a COVID-19 vaccine. We also learned the first doses could reach Oregon in just a few weeks. KW's Pat Doris starts us off. The governor and her health advisors wanted to really grab our attention today to say, yes, there is a vaccine on the way. But in the meantime, the virus is spreading fast. The state announced 2,176 new cases identified Thursday. It's a one-day record for the state. It pushes the number of people infected since the beginning here over 80,000. And 30 more people died. That's another one-day record, pegging COVID's lethal total at over 1,000 in Oregon, 1,003 to be exact. Governor Kate Brown urged everyone to stay vigilant. We are not, we are not out of this crisis yet. I know it's hard to imagine, but in fact, our hardest days still lie ahead. A new report released by the state projects that if the virus continues spreading as it did in late November, Oregon could see as many as 2,000 new cases per day starting December 11th. Our new modeling confirms our worst fears that this pandemic can indeed get much worse before we get the majority of our population vaccinated. But there is hopeful news as well. The first doses of a vaccine, enough to cover 35,000 frontline healthcare workers, could arrive in Oregon in just two weeks. More doses would follow, with a total of 148,000 first doses available by the end of December, along with 119,000 second doses, which would be given three to four weeks after the first. Hospitals will be the primary sites for immunization of the first group of vaccine recipients, the 1A group. That will include healthcare workers, first responders, workers in long-term care facilities and congregate care settings, and long-term care facility residents. While that is good news, the numbers suggest there will be delays for the general public. The governor pointed out there's roughly 300,000 Oregonians that fit that definition for healthcare worker. They'd be first in line for the shots, along with 60 to 70,000 people who live in long-term care facilities. After that, it would be essential workers, people with chronic medical conditions, and older Oregonians. And the rest of us, it'll probably be early spring before we can get the shots. Which means we will hear a lot more about masks and keeping away from others. And until you get vaccinated, you are at risk of getting COVID-19, spreading it to others, and keeping this pandemic going. Nine months after the first case in Oregon, the coronavirus still has the upper hand here. State leaders say there is hope on the horizon, but it's still a ways off. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. Tonight at 5.30, NBC Nightly News digs into how pharmacies plan to roll out a vaccine. Pharmacies like Walgreens will provide it first to healthcare workers in long-term care facilities and eventually to the general public. Walgreens has been working for months on how to store a vaccine and training staff to give it. The company's chief pharmacist says different regulations in each state can definitely present some challenges, but she wants the public to know when a vaccine is ready, pharmacists can be trusted to provide it. The biggest thing is, is that um, the, the community, our, our patients can trust our pharmacists to ensure that they're able to provide this vaccine and do that in a safe and effective way. We have a lot more coverage on vaccines at KGW.com or you can text the word vaccine to 503-226-5088 and we'll send you a link to all of our latest stories. At this point, the virus is spreading so fast, contact tracers can't keep up. In some states like Washington, Colorado, Nevada, there's an app for that, but not Oregon, at least not for another month. So what's taking so long? Well, the state's contact tracing app is set to launch in January 2021. State officials say they're waiting on data from a pilot program at Oregon State University. It started early last month, and while about 9,000 people enrolled, no one has uploaded 
uploaded a positive test result, which of course means nobody has been notified that they've been in close contact with someone who tested positive. A state official told KGW they suspect since classes are online, students think they know everyone they've been around and they're notifying them privately. No official end date has been set for the pilot program. This technology has been utilized in uh, more than 24 to, to 30 states nationwide. Oregon not being the first isn't a problem at all. We want to get it right. But again, it's, it's just one step in the process of, of uh, addressing uh, the virus. If the app does roll out next month, users will be given the option to opt in. It's also important to note the app does not track your location. It just notes any time that an app user gets physically close to another app user. And then when someone uploads a positive test result, the app sends an alert to the people that they've been around and everyone stays anonymous. The increasing number of COVID patients has area hospitals rethinking their policies for who can visit. Tonight, the family of a Woodland, Washington woman shares their struggles as Devin Haskins looks at these changing policies. 80-year-old Patricia Kennedy is in critical condition at Peace Health Southwest in Vancouver with a brain bleed. Her daughters were devastated when they told they couldn't visit. They said once moved to critical care, one of us could come. That was Thursday. Friday morning, sisters Sherry and Cindy say when their mom was moved to the ICU, they were denied. No, absolutely not. No one's coming in. Not even a choice when I said, wait, we were given the option of one or the other. And they said, no, you cannot come up here to this unit. An updated COVID guideline for visitors at Peace Health says patients who are not COVID positive can have one visitor. Peace Health couldn't make someone available for an interview, instead pointing us to their visitation guidelines. I reached out to OHSU and asked if there was something families could do to be better prepared if they were faced with a similar situation. Susan Yoder is the Director of Patient Relations at OHSU. Um, speak to the staff at the bedside and they know how to escalate those questions. We've done enough work that I think most of the staff at the bedside know the parameters for their area and what they can do. Since the pandemic started and now with a surge of patients, hospitals are adjusting guidelines. Each system determines its own visitation policies, so they can be different. Providence told us today they're rolling out new restrictions. One designated visitor is allowed, but some areas may not allow any visitors. Back at Peace Health late today, we heard from Sherry and Cindy. Both were allowed inside to visit and believe they were let in just in time to spend the last minutes of their mom's life by her side. To be able to say goodbye and it's okay to move on. Don't, you know, don't try to fight to come back if you're not whole. In Vancouver, Devin Haskins, KGW News. We've got a follow-up to a KGW investigation. The state medical board suspended an organ doctor who refused to wear a mask while treating patients. Earlier this week, a KGW investigation highlighted controversial comments made by Dr. Stephen Latulip during a pro-Trump rally in Salem on November 9th, then posted on YouTube by the Multnomah County Republican Party. In the video, Dr. Latulip admitted to breaking COVID rules. On Thursday, the Oregon Medical Board voted to suspend his medical medical license. Latulip, who owns and operates Southview Medical Arts in, Dal in Dallas, just outside of Salem, couldn't be reached for comment. West Lynn Police Chief Terry Kruger was fired today following an investigation into the wrongful arrest of a black man from Portland. This scandal dates back to 2017 when then Chief Terry Timius had officers begin a sham investigation into Michael Fesser as a favor to a friend who was Fesser's boss. Kruger was involved in the follow-up investigation into what happened. Kruger has been on paid leave for months now and the acting chief will stay in the same role. West Lynn's city manager said in a statement, I believe that new leadership within the West Lynn Police Department will help the community move forward. This is a step towards restoring confidence in the West Lynn Police Department. And we have continuing coverage on black activists in Portland receiving threatening hate mail. It started this summer and now it's happened again. Camila Adams opened her mailbox recently to find two more letters filled with racial slurs, including a kill list with half a dozen names. Adams and her daughter were at the top of that list. You know, I just want to make sure that uh, my children and I are safe. 
Um, but also too, the authorities need to make sure we're safe as well. City officials need to make sure that we're safe in our community. I care about uh, helping young people find their voices and that's what I do for a living. Yeah, that second person you heard from there was Candace Avalos. She recently ran for Portland City Council. She also received hate mail. She got two racist letters that also included a kill list with 20 names on it. The Portland Police Bureau is investigating the letters.